message today is the second part from the message Pastor Jeff gave last week. It's all about the Good Samaritan. The first part he preached, which if you weren't here or you didn't hear last night or last week, uh, was called You Are Needy. And it was about, in that Good Samaritan story, identifying, hopefully these will last. Our battery illustration lives on, so don't worry, I have backups now. So, um, Pastor Jeff's message was, you are needy, and it was about identifying with the beaten man in the story. And this, the message today is the second part, you are needed. And... Uh, I'm in, a, I'm in a little weird headspace today because, uh, you know, uh, COVID is messing up everything. Um, and uh, normally, for my entire life, we, my family has a big family vacation. We all go on with all my aunts and uncles and cousins and everybody. We always go this week. So, like, today after church, I would be headed, we're, we'd be headed on our family vacation, and they canceled it because my grandmother's 95, and they were worried about 65 people coming together, you know. So, I'm a little bummed. But uh, I don't know if that, that probably didn't have anything to do with anything. So my, my wife said, edit that out. So I'm communicating my headspace. <laughs> no, but the story is from Luke 10. Um, and it's the story of the Good Samaritan. I'm going to read it. You find it, and it's uh, uh, the chunk I'll read is kind of Jesus' actual parable. What happens in the story is um, Jesus is reasoning with some people. And one guy raises his hand to ask a question. He's a guy who knows a lot about the law. He's a legally minded person. And he says, Jesus, you know, what do I have to do to inherit an eternal life? And Jesus is like, whatever's in the law, how do you read it? Which is a kind of a good rhetorical response. He asks that guy a question. That guy answers, well, I read it like this. And he actually says the exact same thing Jesus says when somebody asks him the, great com- the greatest commandment is loving your God totally. And loving your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus is like, yeah, you got it. This guy's got it, you know. But then he asks a further question. Just to clarify, who's my neighbor, you know. And Jesus goes, okay, let me tell you a story here. And this is where, this is where we find the story that we're focusing on, which we call the Good Samaritan. And it goes like this. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on by on the other side. So, too, a Levite, when he came to the place where he saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him, and he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day... He took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He asked the guy. The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, right, go and do likewise. And what we want to look at, what Pastor Jeff looked at last week and kind of made the overarching case for the, both of these messages. And the point that I think he was saying Jesus is making is that God is like the Good Samaritan or Jesus himself is like the Good Samaritan. And that we are, that God, that Jesus is saying, I only do what I see my father doing. And so this kind of activity is the kind of activity you find. It's a window into the kingdom. This is what the kingdom life is like. This is what God is like. Jesus is like this, that we are, he's, that we are kind of in an eternal sense broken and robbed and naked and half dead or full, you know, and he's the one who comes as the great physician, the healer, and, and saying that this is therefore how we should act in response. And you can see that because if you look at the story, it's like, which of these three people would you want to be like, you know, and which one of these people do you think uh, you see the character and nature of God in? But that's an interesting thing because what Jesus did with this story um, as I was researching it, is like it wasn't even a, like in Jesus' day, it wasn't uncommon to teach in parables, um, as it probably isn't today, but very explicitly. You know, like you say, I will illustrate this point I'm going to make with this parable. It's a very common thing to do. And even this structure, from what I was reading, was very common. Like you would say, this thing happened, and then a priest did this, and then maybe a Levite or some other, you know, 
type of leader also didn't do something wrong. But then the third character in the story usually, as other people used it, was a faithful Israelite. That's what the guy's expecting Jesus to do. And Jesus does not do that. He says Samaritan. And he does this on purpose, I think, because it's, it, it would intentionally challenge this man's view. And as Jeff established last week, the, 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 the deal was there was a lot of bad blood between the Jews in the land and the Samaritans. They didn't like each other. They didn't respect each other. There's a lot of religious issues. I mean, there was when the Hebrew people were settling the chosen or the, the, the promised land, God had said, don't intermarry with people. And the Samaritans were kind of like a product of that intermarrying. So a lot of Jewish people were like, you guys are like half-breeds. And then the Samaritans had their own view of like, well, we consider ourselves Jews. Some of them didn't. You know, it was like this, it wasn't, it was a big deal both on religious and like civil grounds. They did not like each other. And the, the they thought of the Samaritan people as uh, lesser. It'd be kind of like what I think Jesus is doing is just by the simple nature of inserting that person, he knows most probably how that would be heard by the person who's he's speaking to. You know, if you ask, there's kind of this, uh, um, if you have to ask, <laughs> when God says something like, love your neighbor, and if you have to ask, even him, or is that guy or that person my neighbor? The odds are yes. That'd be <laughs> that's the implication. So it's kind of like you can even skip asking this question. That Jesus is intentionally picking somebody that would offend him to hear. Be like, wait a minute, that guy? You know, and even maybe more offensive that he's identifying maybe the character and nature of God with this person who would be offensive. And it's not necessarily to elevate Samaritan people in and of themselves. He's making a point. And the point is that I don't want to get too far ahead because I have this as a separate point, but he's he's intentionally picking somebody that guy would hate or very much dislike. So remember that. We'll come back to it because I want to make my point with the right time. <laughs> and I think it's interesting also that Jesus uses this word neighbor goes both ways. It's an interesting word in that it's defining a relationship between two people. So it's between two people. Meaning when he asks the guy at the end, he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? My kind of initial inclination would be to phrase it something more like, who, who saw this man in a neighborly way? Like looking at it from the opposite side. And I think what Jesus does by kind of going back and forth in this w is he kind of helps, like as Pastor Jeff was illustrating last week, that you can identify on either side of this transaction. That neighbor is a relationship between two people that goes both ways, meaning that if someone views you as a neighbor, you're their neighbor. And if you view them as a neighbor, they're your neighbor. It doesn't have to both be there, you see? So it's kind of like, we, on behalf of Jesus, can declare that anyone is our neighbor. And I mean that, in a, in a, uh, in just to be clear, so if anyone's young and you don't understand, neighbor is not necessarily just somebody who lives next door to you. Okay, we have to hear this in a kind of broader spiritual sense. It could mean anybody. And I think as Jesus was Im is implying, or if we're understanding Jesus as being the ultimate good Samaritan, that it does mean anybody. And so, having all of the the power within us to determine who our neighbor is, or in the sense, offer neighborship, that's a word, <laughs> to anyone, or in Jesus' name, be a neighbor to anyone, this is where we get to the point of this message, that just as Pastor Jeff illustrated last week, that we are, ne we are needy, eternally before God, we are needy. And as he reaches us and heals us, and brings us restoration, even promising it, like even if we haven't fully realized it, but we can just trust the fact that I can tie in, I can tie in what, I, okay, so here's this, <laughs> it's a little off script, but um, I was praying during this message yesterday, and I thought of something in relation, I mentioned earlier this, 
in this message off topic that my family would usually be going on vacation this week. <laughs> and um, God sometimes, I feel like, gives me emotional cues in strange ways, sometimes maybe through a movie or, you know, you got, I think you can kind of sense, you know, God operating in different ways uh, in different times. But the, the thing is, if we're sensitive to what God is showing us through something, it's kind of like a parable for ourselves. And so what I mean by that is when I was a kid, we would go on this trip, the one I was just referring to, and it's at Jekyll Island, which is not far from here. My family's from Atlanta. We would always drive down. And when I guess we were really small, it was determined that that drive was too far. <laughs> and I guess the speed limit was 55, so it took a little while. And baby's screaming, and there's less air conditioning involved and all these sorts of things. They decided we would stop halfway on this trip and spend the night on the way down in Dublin, Georgia, which I don't know if anybody, and I hope no one's from there, but there's not, there's not really a much of a place, okay? It's just kind of a stop on the freeway. And I was thinking yesterday how funny that was. We used to drive, split this trip up, and it's, you know, nowadays we'll drive 10 and 12 hours so much, and it doesn't even, you know. But at the time, I, this whatever, we decided to do it. And I was explaining to my wife how funny it was to think about how fondly I feel towards that Holiday Inn at that exit. I mean, absolutely some of the greatest emotional feelings I have, my, like better than any Christmas morning. I mean, it's like this, um, this amazing, because what it represented to me as a small child is this is the first step into this week of awesomeness or whatever it is. And because it was associated with all of that rest of that, it became this amazingly awesome place. And it's still, like, I can, like, I, I can go there right now and feel that feeling of, like, gosh, that's so amazing. And it's not, trust me. <laughs> I've stopped by since. It's a dump of a place. It is, it is just not even a thing worth noting. But what it represented to me and what it was in my life and what it still kind of represents for me as an, an emotional kind of way is this, uh, this parable of sorts of how we are to function in light of the kingdom to come. You see? There's nothing all that special necessarily about us or where we're living or anything maybe about our lives. I mean, frankly, our lives might be a dump kind of like that hotel was, you know. But in association with what's coming, God's kingdom, we can live in this, this, this I mean, the, 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 what we can feel towards this dump of a place, if you follow what I mean by that illustration in my parable, can be so fond, you know. We talk about love covering a multitude of sins and things like that. Like, I can think so positively towards what God has before us and what God has in your life and what God has in my life. It can think so positively that because of what God has promised to come. And then because of that, I can act out of that in this neighborly way. I don't have to prove anything so much. You see, like, the, the, the whole value system is shifted because of this reality of what's coming. <laughs> and for me... Yesterday when I was praying, I, or I was thinking about this. It just all popped in my head. I never saw that it actually might apply to this. But standing up here, it seems as though it does. That God, I pray that you would give us the heart to see how you've reached out to us so that we can, in turn, looking forward to what's to come, what you've promised us, that death does not win, that we can live forever with you, Lord. I pray that you would help us to live with that type of, ice, that type of anticipation now and let that change everything around us. And allow us to see others as neighbor. Because here's the thing, guys. Jesus picks Samaritan. Not a good guy. Not a guy he likes. I thought, well, I could illustrate this by picking different groups of people that hate each other now. And say, like, you know, if God was speaking to this group, he'd pick something. But it's like, I don't even want to go there because there's so much of that already. You can do that yourself. Point being that this isn't somebody that God would like. But he's also making a point that this, that in Jesus' name, he can use anybody, the least likely especially. God can use the least likely person to do the most amazing things. So nobody is disqualified or nobody's like cut out. No, it's not based on abilities. It's not based on, on your pedigree. It's not based on all these things that the, the world is based on. God's kingdom is differently. God, Jesus can say a Samaritan represents me in this picture. And that makes sense because of what he can give to anyone. And as we as an extension can give to anyone. And so every single one of us is necessary in doing that. Nobody's too small. Nobody's too messed up. We're all a part of it. And if Jesus was a good neighbor to us, the, le the, 
the, uh, the least we can do is be a good neighbor to those around us. But he asked the question, who is my neighbor? And really, what that's a paraphrase of is, is – because if you look earlier in the story, what I was telling you, you know, he says, he's asking Jesus about the law. Like, how do I get eternal life? How would you see in the law? Do the law says, love the Lord your God, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. Yes, I agree. Clarifying question, who is my neighbor? Is this parable primarily about caring for people in the sense of like, if you see someone sick, helping them? I would say probably not, though that's definitely part of it. Really what who am my neighbor is, is is a kind of a euphemistic way to say, who do I have to love? Because that's what he's saying. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, well, who's my neighbor then? Who do I have to love? You see, this is not like a big jump. So this whole parable is, is really Jesus answering to him, who do I have to love? And we see, I mean, there's other places in the Bible where Jesus literally tells us that as Christian people, it is a requirement. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm not saying this is easy, but it is a requirement that we love our enemies. So our neighbor would even include those types of people. But I think that it's so often a human, uh, a human trait to try to get out of it. You know, obviously I don't have to love this person. Obviously, if you knew everything, if you knew what this person had done to me, you would know that I don't have to love them. Or if you want to get even way more shallow, these people who stand for this other political thing that I don't agree with, obviously I don't have to love them, you know. And that's just not how, that's not how this works. We don't get a pass to do that ever. Is it hard? Absolutely. Is it a minimal requirement of Christian people? Yes. And it's up to us to sort that out. It includes those close to you, your family, if you're married, your spouse, if you have children, your children, your parents, and even the dysfunctional ones. Now, from that love, we find how we behave towards them, which in this story, seeing the person beat on the side of the road is the person you take care for. Jeff was giving me, we were talking about this, you know, figuring out living with other people, how do you make this work? And there's a, there's a clue to this in, um, in Galatians that uh, I'm going to read it to you. It's in Galatians 6. I'll just read you this whole chunk because I think it's all really good. So it's Galatians 6, 1 through 6. If you want to write that down and go back and look at it on your own time, this is a good thing to study, this chunk. It says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, not harshly. I don't want to start preaching another message, but you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, Watch yourselves or you will also be, may be tempted. Carry each other's, this is where it is. We talk about loads and burdens, okay? Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So you go, burdens, interesting. Okay, keep going. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they are deceiving, they deceive themselves, man. That's good and bad right there. Like, I mean, if you think too much or too low, of your, like, you're deceiving yourself. Again, I don't want to start preaching another message, but I'm going to keep going. Each one should test their own actions. So who, which one? Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone and without comparing themselves to someone else. Man, yeah, we all need to read this probably every day. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction of this word shall share all the good things to the instructor. So we look at this within the context of this list of good ideas of how to live, which, again, we could preach on several different messages here, but... You see, carry each other's burdens and carry your own load. What is a load and what is a burden? How does this work? Here's the short answer. I'm not exactly sure, and neither is Pastor Jeff, <laughs> but for certain, we each have a load, meaning a responsibility in our life, the things we're here to take care of, the things, the people we're here to take care of, all of that sort of thing. And then there's extra load put on us by sin, put on us by the world, put on us by, I don't know, the kind of thing that would cause uh, this guy to be beaten, you know, just on the side of the road. You know, that's not a load. That's a burden. And when we see somebody that's burdened, part of our load is carrying their burden. So you see how this works? So part of my load 
is to, if I see James' burden is to help him with that, that's actually my load. That's not his load. That's my load. But vice versa, the, like I said, this neighbor thing goes both ways. Part of his load <laughs> is if he sees me burden is to carry my bur burden and it becomes his load. You see that? Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I get the words mixed up. <laughs> but I want to make a point here because um, this is like my OCD warning. If you're like me, that doesn't mean that every single, every single person you encounter everywhere that needs anything every, all the time is always your responsibility to completely fix all the time, always. Okay? I say, oh, the church is taking up. We need, you know, 10. Actually, I have an announcement I need to make that I forgot to make. <laughs> we'll do that at the end. <laughs> we're really firing on all the cylinders today. The, uh, um, but if we were taking up donations, for example, we need to feed 10 families and to appease your own guilt. You're like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feed 50 families. And like, we don't even have the 50. Like, like, this is not how this works. Like, sometimes certain people, this can trigger something in their mind, and they feel like I have to do everything, and I have to, you know, this is my warning. That's not what I'm trying to say here at all. What I'm trying to say is if we can learn to follow the example that Jesus is giving us of loving our neighbor, then we can start to evaluate properly what a load is and what a burden is through the lens of loving other people and in the mindset that I've described from my vacation analogy of this, this is great, way better than we're thinking because of what's to come, even if it's a dump down here, you see. What's to come is so great, we can even see this is great due to association. So in that mindset, through the lens of love, I can understand and interpret then what is a burden and what is a load and these sorts of things. And so the command that uh, Jesus says at the end, and what we say, well, what do I do? He just says, go and do likewise. And I think you could also if this is grammatically appropriate, you could say something like, go and neighbor likewise, using neighbor as the verb in that sentence. To go and find in your life the people that you are to love and love them well. And then the details start to work themselves out. Some of the times we'll mess up. Some of the times we'll step in and do things to help people that we think are, that we're real well-meaning, but we're actually not helping people. And, you know, it, it doesn't matter. God will, God's cool, you know, God sees our heart anyway. So, you know, and let that be a warning too. God sees our heart anyway, you know. So if you're doing this to look good, that, that's not it either. You know, the point is, you know, how we interact and how we treat each other and how we help each other is very important. And God sees our heart and all of that. But frankly, though caring for those that are less fortunate is incredibly important. Um, I think this actually speaks to the heart of this kind of pile-on culture that we find ourselves in. Um, it doesn't matter the subject. I'm talking about the spirit behind that. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't matter if this is a conservative subject that we're criticizing or a liberal subject we're criticizing. I mean that in a political sense. This weird pile-on thing. This person said something wrong. Let's destroy them. Or you might, they have this other thing they call this cancel culture. Like, this person did something bad, let's cancel them, meaning like make them not exist or something like that. That's not of the Lord. The heart behind that isn't of the Lord. That's not how, like, this guy has been canceled. And all of the good people in the story don't help. So in one sense, they're saying like, yeah, I'm with that. Or you're like, well, they didn't really do anything. It's like, yeah, they didn't do anything. And I'm not saying, again, like we have to always stand up to everybody all the time. But my point is the heart behind it, you know, this idea that I am righteous in doing this. I'm telling you you're not. And I'm saying that this story tells you that you're not. I think that might bear a lot more like day-to-day -day value um, or we'll at least encounter this type of opportunity a lot more. Because what... Our culture is wanting us to tell each ourselves to do is like, first off, you don't have to love each other. And second off, if somebody says anything wrong, you should destroy them. And that's good and righteous and right. And I believe the kingdom of God is teaching almost the exact opposite. First off, we have to love everyone. And second off, we should have compassion on each other. And even the least likely person to have compassion on someone is, is the person that God is calling to. And the compassion that they're having. You see what I'm saying? Well, you think about... These guys that overlooked him, the Levite, the priest, and they cite, <laughs> this is an interesting, I was reading about this. The priest, in one telling of this, cites kind of like, I can't do this because I'm a priest. 
and like, you know, I can't touch a dead body. There's laws about this. He's right. In Leviticus, there's law about that. He can't touch when he's on his way to do priestly duties. A couple details that stick out that are sort of interesting in this story, which I think Jesus did on purpose. When you're coming from Jerusalem and walking down to Jericho, as it says the Samaritan was doing, from Jerusalem to Jericho, okay? And then the priest is coming the same way. It means he's already done the duties, see? So, first off, kind of a cop-out. Second off, there actually are laws also in Leviticus that are talk about mercy laws and stuff like that that kind of supersede, you know, it's like you need to keep yourself ritually poor, pure for this reason, but there are exceptions because we realize sometimes you pass people on the side of the road that are all beat up and you should help them. You see what I'm saying? It's not worded exactly like that, but you can go find it. Point being, he has kind of two religious cop-out answers that he tries to use, meaning, you know, I would love this person, but I have to do this and I have to do that. And that will probably satisfy most people. Most people probably aren't going to think through what I just said because why would they? You know, they go, oh, yeah, he's a priest. He can't be doing that, you know. And I think Jesus is intentionally just saying that's wrong. You know, we like to use religious religiosity to get ourselves off the hook from loving people. I don't have any good examples of that, but I don't think I probably need any. So go and do likewise. Go neighbor likewise and go love likewise. And this is not easy stuff. This is actually quite difficult because I can tell you that this, this, uh, this culture we're finding ourselves in is getting quite bad at this stuff. Um at an insane level. And even worse than that, like not only are we getting bad at it, we're now saying like the worst versions of this are good, meaning how we're not loving each other. Like I'm supposed to hate that guy, this kind of thing. And no one maybe is literally saying it in those words, but I mean, we can read between the lines. And uh, this is forbidden territory uh, for Christian people. So I'm going to pray. Kayla, I want you to come up and play a song. Um, I'm going to pray, and I have to make an announcement that I forgot, um, but it's important. It's not exactly tied to this message, so it's just kind of a jump. So I'm going to go ahead and make it, and then I'll come back and pray. So last year, you may remember that we had a, the school, this Enterprise Academy, they'd asked us to help provide some school supplies. Well, they've asked again. They're starting up school, and it, what it is is they have, it's kind of a, a standard list of school supplies like any student would need, but they have certain students that can't provide these things, their family, like they're, I don't know how they know this, but they have, you know, they're flagged or something, like these kids are not going to be able to provide these things, and it's up to the teachers to kind of come up with the supplies, and so they've asked, can you guys help again, and we have a list, it's a specific list, we need these things, and so what I'm going to do as soon as this service is over is I'm going to send this list out on our Facebook page, I'll put a link on our website, and I'll put, um, I'll send it out in an email as well to make up for the fact that I don't have it to hand you right now. It's a standard list of things. Here's, here's my request. If you would take this list, pray, and if you're willing, provide all of this. And if you're not, provide some of it or if you can only find some of it. Some of these things may be harder to find. And I'm also going to send out a link that if you don't feel comfortable going to the store or if you just can't go to the store but you want to contribute financially to this, what we can do is then take those finances and then if we get most of the stuff or whatever, we can fill in the gaps with that remaining funds. So if that's cool, that's well, <laughs> we can love our neighbors, I guess. But um, I think it's important. And they've asked us if we could help do this, and we, and we can. And the thing is we've committed to helping a certain amount or a certain number. But if we get beyond that, it's almost a bot. Like there's a need. So we can we can promise that every single thing will get used so so before we sing I want to pray really quick um, the title of this message is you are needed and what the core of that is is that God needs you to share his love in this world every single one of us 
God needs you. I mean, think about this. I mean, you are needed in this community. You are needed in this kingdom that God has. And that's not something to be taken lightly. And this command to love these all neighbors is quite difficult. But I believe that the youngest among us in this room knows what I'm saying is true. That it's so obvious when you stand and look at a story like this, like, which person would you want to be? Which person would you want to be like? Which person would you want God to be like? Every single one of us knows the answer to that question, even hearing the story for the very first time. So, Father, I pray that you would open our eyes to our neighbors and open our eyes to see those around us the way you see them. Give us that mindset I described of the anticipation of the kingdom to come, that we're living in, like we've just started into that kingdom, this inaugurated kingdom, but the greatest things by far are yet to come. But even through that, we can see what's happening now with the eyes of amazement and just excitement of what, what you're up to, even now. And bless this group of people to be a people of love, Father, I pray that we would live in this, this, this mindset, this reality of love for each other, and then extending that to those around us, Lord, and that it would be winsome to draw people to you, Lord, to draw people to saving understanding of who you are in this, in this time and this place, and also just to help those that are in need, Lord. Give us a heart for that. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't want to stand, we're going to sing.